Thank you, Chad. Uh, it's first time here. Never been to this church before. I already like you, though. I'm grateful. I've been in Thailand now since 1992, and your church has now twice sent me teams to help our work there. I'm very grateful. They're, that's very hard ground there, as you can imagine, with uh, cities with no Christians at all, uh, whole communities where, where no one has ever heard God's name, that when I talk to people about God, I have to explain who he is, that they've never even heard the concept of God, and I have to tell them that God is the one who made the world. And very difficult to, to call people to repent of their sin and turn to God when they've never heard of him, that their parents have never heard of God, that their grandparents have never heard of God, that their city has never had a Christian since God made Adam and Eve. Uh, but your church has twice now sent me teams to go into communities, and when we go in and do mobile clinics and share Christ with all the patients to come, and, and we get to see people come to the Lord in places where they've never had a Christian, that makes me, that makes me like you. So I'm glad to be with you. I'm <clears throat> going to talk about Jonah. If you have your Bibles, you can look with me through Jonah. We're, going to, we're just going to try to race through the whole chapter today. Uh, since it's a missionary book about a missionary, from a missionary, about missions, I thought it would apply to me, and so that's important so that I get something out of the sermon today. And since you've sent me uh, two short-term mission teams, and Jonah was a short-term missionary to Nineveh, I thought it would apply to those who have gone. And for those of you who are going to give today to international missions, and those of you who are praying for international missions, and those of you who are praying for God to call people to himself all over the world, you will likely find something that applies to you too. Verses 1 and 2, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah. God speaks to Jonah. That's, that, that just grabs you, doesn't it? The fact that God would speak to anybody, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's remarkable. But that God would speak to somebody like Jonah just floors us. Jonah wrote this book, we, 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 we see, and... Uh, if that's the case, then we can at least be impressed with his honesty because from his own writings, from his own words, from his own lips, and from his own pen, he seems to be the worst missionary in the whole Bible. <laughs> he starts his book by disobeying God. He ends his book by whining and complaining against God. And so we question his motives and attitudes for everything he does in between. And yet God speaks to Jonah. Uh, that's remarkable. And, and we love this book, and we love this story, because it's not so much the, the story of the flaws of Jonah, because Jonah has plenty of flaws, it's, but it, it, doesn't, it's not a high, it doesn't highlight the flaws of Jonah, it highlights the heart of God, that it is God's heart to rescue men. In chapter 1, chapter 1 is going to end today with God saving Jonah from the sea. Chapter 2 will end with God saving Jonah from the belly of the whale. Chapter 3 will end with God saving Nineveh from their sin. And chapter 4 we'll see God save Jonah from the heat of the sun. Every chapter, every step, it's reiterated and told again and again that God has a heart to rescue men. And why do we read this and why do we get inspired to do missions, to support missions, to give to missions? Because God has a heart to rescue men and, and, and we want to be like our, our father. We want to be like our dad. And since his heart is to rescue people, that's our heart too. Verse 3, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Twice in this one verse, we see Jonah accused of the unthinkable. He wants to run away from God, to flee from the presence of God. Who would, who were offered the presence of God? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What a promise. If we want to be close to God, we can be as close to God as we want. We can come into the presence of God when we have devotions in the morning, we pray and read his word. We can be in the presence of God, the one who made the word. That's remarkable. Who would run away from that? And that's what Jonah said to do right here. He runs from the presence of God. Now, first of all, when we think about that, we think, well, good luck with that. 
And David says, you know, if I go into heaven there, you are there. If I go into the depths of the sea, you are there. If I go to hell, you are there. Where can I go to hide from your presence? Where can I go where you are not? You are everywhere. How can I hide from your presence? So in a way, Jonah's attempt to flee from the presence of God is ridiculous. You can never be away from God. But in a way, in a tragic way, he can be successful. As David also writes, the upright, only the upright can dwell in the presence of God. The disobedient cannot. And if he, when he was in the, the belly of the ship, God was there. When, when he was in the belly of the whale, God is with him. And if he had been successful and disembarked from his ship on distant shores, his distance from home would not have disqualified him from coming into the presence of God. But what from the ship couldn't do and fleeing couldn't do and the whale couldn't do and going far away couldn't do, his disobedience sadly accomplished. It took him from the presence of God. And although we have the the opportunity, although we are given the great privilege of coming into the presence of God, we are not given the right to come to God and drag our sin in with us. We are reminded today that we cannot cling to sin and try to hold on to God. And Today, if there's any sin that you've come in with today, that you've been dragging in and clinging on to, Oh, may the Lord help us so that we would crave nothing but God and dread nothing but sin because sin will disqualify us from this great opportunity to come into the presence of God. I'd like to talk about that more, but we've got to go on. Verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Jonah has turned his back on God and has turned on his back on what God has prepared for him for the sake of his own agenda. And so God's response to that, God's response to Jonah's disobedience is he sends Jonah a storm. And sometimes storms can be very helpful to turn our attentions back to God. I think about in Thailand how many people have come to Christ because of the storms in their life. I I just baptized Noom a couple months ago, and he came to Christ because his wife left him, and he was devastated, and in his devastation, he found hope in God. I think about Machui, she had problems with the demonic, and that brought her to Christ. I think about Jit, she was sick, and she came to Christ. Child, same thing, she was sick and thought she was going to die, and because of her sickness, she came to God. And you think about in your own life, how many of us came to God out of desperation. We were in trouble. We had great need. We had some kind of personal conflict. We had some kind of health conflict. We had some problems. And out of that great need, we found Christ. And still today, sometimes in great mercy, one of God's kindest acts to do for us is to send us a storm when we are starting to be distracted by other matters. Because storms can be very helpful in turning our attentions back to God. Verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, laid down, and was fast asleep. The storm's beating up on the ship. The ship's about to break apart. The sailors are in fear for their life. The cargo is sacrificed, and Jonah's asleep. Sleeping through the whole thing, and we're reminded that sinners are sleepers. We have to wake them up. That, if I can go back to be a, be a doctor for a second, sin is a spiritual anesthetic. It deadens our conscience. It blinds our mind. It stupefies. That has a stupefying effect on us so that we don't pay attention to God's calling and we don't pay attention to the needs around us. We don't pay attention to the fact that our sin is killing us. You can think about the examples that you could probably list on your hands, the people, your sons, your daughters, your people that you love in your family, friends, their sin is killing them. It's ruining their relationship with God, ruining their relationship with other people. They're addicted to this or they're committed to that. They've gotten this relationship so bad and they're just ruining their life and they are just sleeping through the whole thing. (laughs) Completely unaware of what they're doing. And if we do not wake them up, their sin will kill them. We have to wake them up because sinners are sleepers. (sighs) Oh, Tragic example, I have t- 
sadly too many. Uh, we sent out from our church, husband and his wife, to go start a new church about an hour away from us. They did a wonderful job, planted a church. Then, then he got sick and he passed away. But in his, after his departure, his wife carried on the work a long time in, in the church, did a great job. People kept coming, people were getting saved. It was wonderful. And then news came to me and my wife that she had uh, started living with a guy, pastor's wife. Pastor dies, her husband dies, and she starts living with the guy. Unbelievable. We can't believe this is true. So we call her in for a meeting, and we said, is this true that you're living with this guy? Yes. Yeah, he's coming in. He's staying with us. He's, he's you know, helping out with the kids. You know, we have three kids, and he's helping out with the kids. So he's staying in your house. Yeah. He's staying in your bedroom. Yeah. You're living as husband and wife. Yeah. My kids are okay with it. I said, I am not okay with it. It was interesting to look at this woman's face. She had no guilt, no remorse, no attention. My kids are, my kids need a dad. I feel so bad that they don't have a dad. I, my, so I brought this guy in. We're kind of shacking up for a while while we take care of the church. No remorse, no guilt whatsoever. And then I, not half shouted, I'd say half shouted. It was a, it was a shout. I am not okay with it. And she fell off her chair, fell on her knees, and said, please tell me what I should do. Completely repentant, completely sorrowful. We went to her house and kicked the guy out. She's back up and running now. She's back serving the Lord again. She's out witnessing again, out leading other people again. But she was completely asleep. And until we woke her up, she would have just kept on doing it until her sin killed her spiritual life. Sinners are sleepers. For those of you who, are, who know your sons and your daughters and your, your, your people that you love and they're going through, they're addicted to this and they're committed to that, they're in that relationship that they should not be in, they're just sleeping through the whole thing. We have to wake them up or their sin will kill them. Verse 6. We'll do six and seven together. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we might not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we can know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. I like this a lot because I live in Thailand and where people don't know God. When I say, have you ever heard about God before? That's how, usually how I start sharing Christ. Have you ever heard about God before? Nope, who is that? He's the one who made the world. Really? Somebody made this place? Yes, and he has a plan for you. So we have to start from scratch. They've never met a Christian. They don't know. They've never seen a Christian life. They've never heard about God. But like Jonah, God gives even lost people spiritual insights. That's very helpful to me. Even lost people have spiritual insights that God has given them. Right here we have an example of three. First one, the captain comes down and says, What are you doing sleeping? Get up! You should be praying. Ah, even lost people know they should pray. Isn't that interesting? He's not even a Christian. He doesn't even know God. But he knows that Jonah should not be sleeping. You should be praying. There's people dying out here. There's people that are going to die. There's no hope for them. You should not be lounging around. You should be praying for us. May no one say that our life is characterized by lounging. We should be praying. Praying that God will save people. Spiritual insight number one, the captain says, you should be praying. You shouldn't be lounging around. Spiritual insight number two, they know that there's no such thing as luck. They cast lots because they know. They don't know who God is, but they know that there's an unseen hand controlling the universe. That's pretty good spiritual insight, huh? That helps us when we're witnessing to the next person over. They might say, I don't believe in God, but God gives them spiritual insights. Spiritual insight number three is they know that the storm is not a natural occurrence. They know that this storm came from sin. Not only just sin, it's they, they, they know that it came from the sin of somebody on board. That's pretty good spiritual insight. Now in John, remember, we know that the, they, they bring the blind man to Jesus. They say, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither one, neither one. So we know that sometimes tragedy does not, is not the result of personal sin. We know that sometimes tragedy does not come because we've sinned. But here it sure does. And these people pick it up on pick up on it. They say somebody on board has sinned, so we're going to figure this out. 
because this is not a natural occurrence. Sin has brought this problem upon us. That's very helpful to me to see that even lost people have spiritual insights. I was in this place called Bang Nam Prio not so, so long ago. No Christians there at that time. Now we have a church there. But at that time, no Christians. Not a single Christian. Never had been a Christian as far as we know since God made Adam and Eve. Went there with a the mobile clinic. People came to get, to get their health needs met. And, and then uh, had, I had, I always remember Peeper Toom. Peeper Toom came in. She was patient number nine. For some reason, I just never, never will forget that. She was patient number nine that day. And I said, Peeper Toom, so we talked to her about her health needs. And I don't even remember what she had, but she was here for something hurt. I don't know. And so I talked to her about her health needs and said, now this is what you need for your body. Now let's talk about what you need for your soul. Shared Christ with her and what God's plan was for her. And God made the world, made her to be... Uh, sinless, but she's sinned, and she can't fix her sin with her own merit, so Jesus died and rose again, and if she'll take Jesus as her Lord, he'll take away her sins and give her a place in heaven. Well, she had never heard it before, but she had spiritual insights. She said, I need that. I, I'm a sinner. I, I have to have my sin forgiven, but I've never met a Christian before. I don't know anything about Christianity, and I'm a Buddhist. I don't know. I can't do this, but I can't leave it alone. I can't do it, but I can't leave it alone. What should I do? So, in her her minimal, her, her fledgling spiritual insight, she said, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll become a Christian for five days. I'll become a Christian before five days, and if I like it, I'll keep it. So I don't know what you would do. I don't know if I did what, what, I, what, what I did was right or not. I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I did. I'm not going to say it was right. She said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to become a Christian for five days. I said, sold. You become a Christian for five days. And if uh, for any reason you are dissatisfied with your new life in Christ, you can return it. And I will restore your helpless life of losing this absolutely free. So she did. She prayed. She said, God, I'll be a Christian. I'll follow you for five days. So she went back. Now, her situation at that time was pretty desperate. She, was, she and her husband were living under a bridge. Uh, homeless people, they, they made these little kanoma, we call them kanoma in Thailand, little, little sweet things. They, they'd sell them in the market and then, uh, then buy food for the day, and then the next day they'd do it again. They, would sell, they, they couldn't keep them. They didn't keep overnight. They, you just sell what you can, then throw the rest away. Next day, make enough to buy enough to eat. And desperate situation. So she went to her husband and said, well, uh, went to the mobile clinic, and I became a Christian. Really? Yes. I, I said I was going to become a Christian for five days. And he said, well, you better start right now with this new God of yours because we haven't sold anything today. We, we, nothing is sold. And, we gotta, and it was time to close up. So she said, okay, uh, new Christian God, please help us sell all our stuff. So she said, here, let me do this. I'll, because um, it's starting to rain, she said, I got to get out. So I, I'll take half of our stuff back to where we live under the bridge about 10 minutes away. I'll take half the stuff and then come back and you can close up everything else and we'll, we'll throw everything away we haven't sold and we'll go back. So she went, she came back and her husband was, we sold every, every bit of it. We sold everything we made. So the next day she had another prayer, new answer. Third day, third prayer, third answer. Fourth day, fifth day, five prayers, five answers, she was hooked. After that, uh, life became a lot different for her. And they not only sold out every day, they started doubling what they made and doubling what they sold, tripling what they made, tripling what they sold, quadrupling, and pretty soon they bought a little place to live. Then they uh, built a little restaurant in front of their house and uh, completely transformed their life by, by Christ living in them. Uh, she didn't read, but she had on her, all her tables in her restaurant, she had tracks. She's like, do you think it would be all right if I, I gave tracks to all the people who came to eat at our restaurant? I said, I think that's all right. <laughs> Completely transformed from the fledgling spiritual insights that the Lord had given her. We got to go, we got to go. Okay, verse 8. Verse 8 and verse 9. Then they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you? So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Here, I like this. Jonah does a lot of stuff wrong, but I think he does something right here. They ask, who are you, and what's your business here? What's, what's your deal in life? And instead of going on, yeah, on and on about 
all his accomplishments. Instead of emphasizing his, his accomplishments in life, he just emphasizes what God has done. He doesn't talk about himself. He says, I worship God who made heaven and earth. And when we introduce ourselves to others, may we be equally as committed to just telling people what God has done rather than telling people what we have accomplished. We better go. Verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. What are you doing? Why are you fleeing from God? And how do you think you can get away with it? What are you thinking about? And more importantly, why did you drag your trouble on us? It reminds me that sin causes the innocent to suffer. The ship's about to be wrecked. The sailors fear for their lives. The cargo had to be sacrificed. They didn't do anything wrong. Jonah sinned. The innocent suffer. We sin. Jesus suffered. It's a fact of this world we live in. The sin of one man causes his wife to suffer. Dad sin and children suffer. Husbands sin and wives suffer. It is the tragic reality of the result of sin in society. And it just breaks your heart to see our sin cause others to suffer. May the Lord help us today. Say, Lord, I will not do that again. On this day, from this day on, I commit myself to you so that I will not fall in sin and cause others to suffer. Verse 11 and 12. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will be calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. And now we see that true repentance has come to him. Because true repentance makes us willing to be punished. When you, when you catch a kid doing something wrong and you say, you did that wrong, you say, yeah, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but don't spank me! He just said he got caught. But when we're willing to take our punishment, then we know that true repentance repentance has come. And just like David, it, we, we, we see that God forgives, God forgives, God forgives, we like that part, but God punishes. God forgives sin, God punishes sin. We want A, we don't want B. But we are broken by our sin and say, I will take B, I will take, but just pun I will take any punishment you would have me take. I am ready, I have sinned, I am so broken about it, Take any punishment, I'll take it. And so Jonah here takes his punishment. He chooses his punishment. Death by drowning. That's a repentant guy. Death by drowning. Then we know that finally Jonah is changing. Verse 11, uh, 13 and 14. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it was pleasing to you. Uh, they don't want to kill Jonah. They don't want to execute Jonah. They try, 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 try as hard as they can to save Jonah's life. But in the end... They see that there is something more important than human life. This is an important point. There's something even more important than human life. The value of a human life is inestimably high. How can you put a price tag on the value of human life? If someone would ask, how valuable is your son's life? Well, well what price tag would we put on it? It is, it is inestimably high. The value of a human life is so high we can't calculate it, but there's something even more important. The honor of God is even more valuable than the value of a human life. And so the men try and try and try to save Jonah's life, but in the end, it is God's honor that must be upheld, even when it means the death of one of his creation. I go to Thailand and I, I rejoice. I, I love seeing people saved. I love seeing people come to Christ. 
when I, when I get to see people who are steeped in sin and locked in sin and no hope for their life, didn't know God, and then they come to know Christ, I just, I just love that. But there's something even more important to me than that. When I go to these cities with tens of thousands of people and no Christians, no one worshiping God, that is not right. That God would create humans and humans would give him no honor. That God would recreate them, create mankind. That Jesus would come and live and die for us. And no one would give him due honor. That is not right. And so I go to these cities so that men can be saved, yes. I want to see people saved and come to heaven, yes. But I want to see God honored and God glorified in every town and every city and every nation. And that's why we give to missions, we go on missions. Because even as great as the value of mankind is, the value of honoring God is even higher. And God deserves the praise of men. And where he is not praised, we must fix it. And we must go and share the message so that he is honored in every corner of the earth. Where to go? Verse 15 and 16. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They, uh, at the beginning, they were praying to their own God. Now they're praying to Jonah's God. And they fear Sin. When we rebuke sinners, when we punish sinners, others fear and follow suit. They want to be right with God because they fear the punishment. Well, better go on. Verse 17. Then the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. He's in the sea. He's sinking in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. There could be no more hopeless situation than Jonah is. He's sinking in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. There is no hope for survival, and a fish comes and swallows him whole. There's a lot about being in a fish that's not fun, I'm assuming. <laughs> I don't think it smells good. I don't think the temperature's right. Uh, I, but there's air there. Plenty of air to live. And when he thought he was going to die, God saved him. Chapter 1 ends with God saving Jonah from the sea. Chapter 2 ends with God saving Jonah from the belly of the fish. Chapter 3 ends with God saving Nineveh from their sin. Chapter 4 ends with God saving Jonah from the heat of the sun. Every chapter, the heart of God described. It is God's heart to rescue men. And it's got to be our heart, too. Father, please, would you call us to yourself? Please, Lord, would you help us to know what you would have us do to respond to your word here? Father, Lord, it's our desire that you would be glorified in every corner of the world. What would you have us do to bring that to pass? In Jesus' name, amen.